Hey, folks, uh, let me make an announcement. Uh, Brother John O'Malley is going to be doing the forum in a little while. Um, he made a suggestion. You might want to, I hate to get you guys to move, but you might. these sections here might want to move a little further over because the missionaries will be here. You'll be able to see them as they give their answers, okay? As we put them on the hot seats, we call it tonight. Okay? Looking forward to that. We, Carrie's going to start us off with a song, and we've got uh, Brother Jeremiah and his family going to be singing tonight, and I think Sergio and Heather are singing tonight. Yes, Wonderful. And we're going to introduce you to an evangelist that is there at the church uh, this weekend, uh, Brother Jamie Jackson. He's going to tell about his ministry in a little bit, too. And let's see what else. We've got the forum we're going to do, and just have a good time together. So sit back, relax. Um, some of the questions might jog some things in your mind about questions you want to talk to them after the service about. Okay? Looking forward to tomorrow. Our goal for the temporary goal is $60,000, and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay? And pray that we'll go much over that, and for the sake of the gospel, as Brother John preached on the other night, and for the cause of our Savior. Okay, Brother Kerry. All right, would you go ahead and take your hymnals with me? Turn to number 526. 526, let's stand up together. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. We're going to sing all three verses of this one. Number 526 together on that first verse. Heart the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert dark and drear Calling the sheep who've gone astray For from the shepherd's fold away Bring them in, bring to the fold where they'll be sheltered from the cold bring them in bring them in bring them in from the fields of sin bring them in bring them in bring the wandering ones to Jesus on the last verse together out in the desert hear their cry out on the mountains wild and high good there you go you ready on the course here we go ready bring them in bring them in bring them in from the fields of sin bring them in bring them in bring the wandering ones to jesus Thank you so much. You may be seated. Did you notice the name of the writer of the song? Uh, it's, it's a joy having my grandson here in the service, Grace and John and Sarah. And then Laura and Josiah, we have our presented with not only a grandson this year, last year, but also a granddaughter, and her name is Alexena. The name comes from the song we just sung. Alexena Thomas, she was a lady. She actually wrote the words to the song, and that's where my daughter got the name. Okay, and it's taken me months to be able to say that word, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Brother Jeremiah, why don't you come on? Um, uh, he is going to, we got a, about a two, three minute video I think he's going to show. Um, he said to the preacher, I forgot to tell them. We talked about the past. We're going to show you something about the future for, for Anchor Baptist Church, okay? Come on up, preacher. All right, folks. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to see you again tonight. And uh, missed you last night, but I heard there was a wonderful preaching. I heard there was wonderful singing. Matter of fact, we saw some of it, and it was a wonderful time. And so thankful to be here. Of course, joined again with my family, uh, my wife, Heather, my son, Nathaniel, and N N Nehemiah, Noah. I forgot my own children's names. And then uh, Natalia and Naomi. And we're also joined tonight by uh, two of our really just... 
faithful members, and they're a family, husband, wife, and brother Sergio and Heather Corona, and uh, they are just a huge, huge, huge blessing to our church, have been there from the very beginning. She's our pianist. He's one of our Sunday school teachers and leads music at our church, and I've asked them to sing a song uh, tonight after our family sings that has become really uh, just a dear song to our church and something that has really been a motivator and an encouragement for us. And then we have evangelist Jamie Jackson, and praise the Lord, he's going to be preaching for us on uh, tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. We're excited to have him with us, and it's going to be a good time. And he, he just got told also he's helping me baptize somebody. Uh, praise the Lord, we're excited about it. Went out soul winning this morning. And had 27 of our church members go out and uh, had 17 people trust Christ as their Savior. Uh, we also had one of our ladies in our church, dear woman, uh, Miss Doris, her grandson, his name is Jermaine. He's a double amputee. And uh, she came to me and she said, Pastor, uh, somebody needs to come talk to him. And so now he's told me, every time I've talked to him, he says, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. But she said, he wants to be baptized. I said, amen. So I went to go meet with him tonight. And I said, you know, Jermaine. I said, what's, uh, what's on your heart? What's going on? And he said, well, he said, Pastor, I need to be baptized. And he just kind of put an emphasis on it. And I said, amen. I said, but out of curiosity, 40 years old, I said, what, what, why the motivation now? What's the emphasis? I'm just curious. I said, I'm not trying to deter you. And uh, he said, Pastor, I was woke up in the middle of the night, and God woke me up. He said, uh, he said and I just was fearful that I wasn't baptized. I thought, well, that's weird. I said, well, let me ask you this, Jermaine. I said, if you died before you got baptized, I said, where do you think you'd go? He said, I'd go to hell. I said, there it is. So I took the Bible. We sat down, went into John chapter number three, showed him old Nicodemus and uh, talked about baptism, talked about salvation, took him over to Acts chapter number eight, talked about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And all of a sudden his eyes come open and he says, pastor, I'm not saved. I said, glory, and he bowed his head and trusted Christ as Savior, but he's getting baptized tomorrow, and so now he's getting baptized, amen, because he believes, and uh, so anyway, I'm going to need some help with that, and so I got some help, praise God, to baptize a double amputee tomorrow named Jermaine. Hey, so uh, we do, what's going on in the future for us? We are, uh, we are outgrowing our building, and I totally forgot to bring this up. I, how, how, how could I, right? Uh, but we're outgrowing our building currently, and our sanctuary can only hold about 85. And so you don't wait till you have 85 to realize you got a problem. You start realizing that early. And so um, I've been telling our folks, we need to be praying. We need to be praying that God would allow us to have more room. So how do we do that? We're in a storefront. And so we've been praying for a new building. And uh, interesting, through my retirement, uh, there's a DAV building. Literally, if you're looking at our church, two doors to the right of us. And uh, the backs of our buildings are only about 25 feet apart. And so um, there's a bar in between us. <laughs> We're praying that shuts down. And uh, anyway, so um, they, they called us up, and they have shut down that DAV building, and they said, uh, man, we, we'd sure love to sell it to you. And I said, well, amen, we'd love to buy it. And so through it all, they contacted me about a week and a half ago, said, Pastor, it appraised at over $110,000. we would like to offer it to your church for $85,000. And so we are going to be buying that building. So what I did was, you know, I'd already talked to our men about it, spoke to them. We've been praying about it. The whole church had been praying about it. But I wanted to give them a vision of what that building is. And so that's what this, this video is. It's a vision of where we're going. What it allows us to do is temporarily move our sanctuary into the new building so we can then demolition our current building and knock about three classrooms out, open up our sanctuary. We'll have seating for about 150, 130 to 150, pardon me. And then, um, and then we're going to rebuild our nursery, put in three more classrooms, and then our new building becomes our banquet hall. Uh, it becomes an event hall. It becomes classrooms, a uh, whole lot of things, amen? And so it, it's a transition. It's a process, uh, but that's what God has been doing with us. And so I want you to see that vision, if you would. Stay on fire. 
fire in the fire, burning up with zeal, spending all your giving on something that is real, living every moment to show his mighty power, even when you feel the heat, stay on fire. Three Hebrew children face the fiery flame, wooden bowed to idols, kept standing just the same. Furnace consumed them, it would not Came out of the fire, burning hot for God Stay on fire in the fire, burning up with zeal Spending all your giving on something that is real Living every moment to show His mighty power Even when you feel the heat, stay on fire Christians are not in the fight, they think it's time to rest. But if you're known as lukewarm, God said he'd spew you out. So serve your God with fervor until you hear the shout. Stay on fire in the fire, burning up with zeal. Spending all your giving on something that is real. Every moment to show his mighty power, even when you feel the heat, stay on fire, stay on fire, stay on fire in the fire, burning up with zeal, spending all your giving on something that is real, living every moment to show his mighty power, even when you feel the heat, stay on fire. don't have that building yet, but I was given a vision, and so that, that's the way we envision it to look, amen? And uh, having that, that sign up there and the American flag and the Christian flag, the flagpoles are there, they just need to be used, amen? And so uh, that, yeah, that vision, uh, that building is 2,200 square feet, it has the meeting area, has four offices, a full kitchen, a washroom, and uh, two ADA bathrooms. And uh, right now, as it is, it's got a, uh, two brand new train AC units, heat and AC units in them. And uh, it, it really is a, a, a very nice building. The roof is good, no leaks in the roof. And so that's a blessing as well. And so we're very, very excited about that. Uh, Pastor, at this time, we'll just, we'll sing. Amen. All right, family, if I could ask you to come. I also want to say thank you. I've got my preacher boy, one of my preacher boys here, Ben, who is going to be holding our child while we sing. He helps out in many different ways. A young girl weeps in a far distant land. She has no one to show her God's love. No mother or father to wipe away the tears. She cries out in the night alone. Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll go to dry that young girl's tears. 
I'll serve you no matter where the path may lead. Lord, please bury my heart. A mother grieves for her starving child. She has no shelter from the cold. Earthly provisions will ease their suffering, but who will ease their empty souls? Bury our hearts on the mission field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to these suffering ones. I'll go wherever you want us to go. Lord, please bury our hearts. Will you ignore these lost souls in the night? Can you hear their pleading cries? They're begging for someone to show them the way. We must go before another one dies. Bury our hearts on the mission field, Lord. These distant voices won't fade away. We'll do your will, no matter the cost. Lord, please bury our hearts. Lord, we give you our hearts. Lord, I give you my heart. a minute and tell about his ministry as an evangelist and i think sergio and heather you guys singing tonight Amen. okay we'll do that in just a little bit um it's our pleasure to have howard and sandra vinson with us and uh, i've known these folks for a long time great folks they just he, brother howard just retired i'm not gonna steal your thunder i'm gonna let you come and tell us about it okay and the ministry is going into he and sandra we th love these folks and i meant to introduce brother matthew you and queenie they just got in this afternoon from India. Well, they've been in the States for a couple months, and uh, so we're glad that you guys are here with us. They'll be in the services all day tomorrow with us, so exciting about that, too. Brother Howard? I'd like to thank Pastor Charles for having me here for this uh, missions conference. It's a blessing to be here. This is our first missions conference that we have been to. I just left my church um, Easter Sunday. We turned it over to the uh, new man, the new pastor that's there. We, uh, I promised my church that when I got ready to retire that I would not leave them nor forsake them during this time because I believed it was a critical time in the church's history. And I wanted to make sure that the church did not flounder or the church did not have some real problems. And I wanted to see the church through. I promised them that many months before I told them that I was going to retire. I just kept telling them, I'm getting older, I'm going to retire. Uh, so uh, the time came, and when I told them that I was really going to retire, they liked to faint it. You know, uh, I've been there for 46 years, almost 47 uh, preaching the Word of God. We've always had a small church. God allowed me to come to my hometown in 1975 and plant Hunterdale Baptist Church. Um, I didn't know when God called me to the ministry where I would go, but he allowed me to go to my hometown. Uh, I had several places I was looking at to go, to go start the church, and um, he just kind of zeroed in, and he told me in Jeremiah in the first chapter, he says, go where I've told you to go no matter who sets their face against you. And believe you me, I wasn't there a month when, when the, somebody's face got set against us and caused us all kinds of problems, but God saw us through. Um, my name is Howard Vinson, and this is my wife, Sandra. Would you stand, honey? This June, we'll be married 53 years. Amen. And I praise the Lord for a wonderful wife. And uh, she's been by my side all these years and helped me through 
uh, what we're doing at Hunterdale Baptist Church. Uh, I never had a right-hand man. I guess I had a right-hand lady, you know, to help me all those years uh, that we were pastor there. It seemed strange not to be there. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a new chapter in our life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're looking forward to what God has for us here. Um, we have one daughter and two grandchildren, um, and so we are, thank the Lord for that. We don't get to see them very often, but we do get to see them occasionally, and we praise the Lord when we get to see them. Now, all through my ministry, God has led me through the Scriptures. I'm just not one who just believes in jumping up and doing something when it comes to God's work. I want to know what God wants me to do. Same thing is true when I uh, started considering what I was going to do when I retired. I thought I would just be a, 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 someone that goes into the church, an interim pastor, to help the church just get through while they chose the next pastor. I went to a class that they had at Ambassador Baptist College a couple of years ago, and uh, it was called Rescuing Churches. And while I was there at that class, God began to lay on my heart what to do when I retired. A lot of churches, when their pastors retire, the people in the church do not know what to do. The people in my church did not know what to do because I'd been there for 46 years. And so that's the only, I'm the only pastor they've ever known, a lot of those people. Uh, so uh, seeing them through that, that time uh, helped prepare me for what I'm getting ready to do in the near future. So I'm just getting started in this. I just started making phone calls on Thursday because I've been so wrapped up in our church to try to get it transitioned to where it needs to be. Uh, but I am looking forward to going out and helping other churches to transition, to have a smooth transition. My prayer was, Lord, help me to have such a smooth transition in our church that the only difference would be a, do, a new face in the pulpit. And I think that we were pretty close to doing that and what God would have us to do there at Hunter Neal Baptist Church in Franklin, Virginia. Now, uh, God, has, um, God, has, uh, God saved uh, us uh, many years ago, but some things that God showed me in the process of this is what he wanted me to do is, is this. I saw, I saw three things. Number one, uh, God allowed David to get the building materials together to build the temple, but he didn't get to build the temple. Well, I've seen our church go up, you know, in some, uh, in some uh, uh, attendance and things. And uh, since COVID come, has come, we're, we're down uh, right good. But uh, nevertheless, all the bills are paid. Never, no, never owed anybody any money. I got a full paycheck every week, even though COVID was going on. God did some marvelous things and sent us some extra money in from people on the outside of the church to help the church. It's just amazing what God has done. Secondly... Uh, so I'm trusting that now the new pastor is going to come in and build on what we've established over all these years and be able to take it further than what I could take it there in my ministry at Hunterdale Baptist Church. Secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, um, God uh, sh showed me some other things uh, in the scriptures. Uh, he showed me that Moses was out in the wilderness, because we all remember this wilderness story about Moses, but Moses was out there a certain period of time, and God said, Moses, it's time for you to move. Ah, well, I preached a message on that on Wednesday night, and we got back to the house, and my wife said, do you know what you preached on tonight? I said, I know exactly what I preached on. I said, God showed me the same thing that he showed you when I was putting the message together. <laughs> you know, so uh, it's just amazing how God works and brings all these things together. And then one night, um, I, had some, I had some stomach issues, so sometimes in the night I have to get up, go get on the couch, and sit up a while and lay back and try to go to sleep and things. And before I got to the couch... God said, I'm going to be with you. Don't get discouraged. He said, I'm better take care of you. He says, just stay on track. Amen. You just stay on track. So that's what I'm trying to do is stay on track, trust God, and I believe God's going to help us to get to our destination at the proper time so we can do the job he has called us to do. Now, our, our theme verse is Ezekiel 22:30, and you got a sign up there. Stand in the gap. Well, that's what we're going to do. Now, if you'll come back Sunday morning for Sunday school, I'm going to show you some things that God has showed me about standing in the gap. And I trust it be a blessing to you if you can be here uh, tomorrow morning. All right, so here's what the Bible says. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, And I sought for a man among them that he should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Well, my wife and I have volunteered to God to stand in the gap for the church from which he died 
to try to save those churches, rescue those churches, to keep those churches from closing their doors, and to try to bring in a new pastor so the church can transition without a lot of problem. Now, for me to do that, I have to try to get to those churches as early as possible after the pastor leaves. I will not knock on the church's door. I'll not call the church and say, hey, I heard you lost your pastor. I'm a, I don't want to do that. Through the simulation of the literature and things we have with you good folks that are here, other preachers that I'm going to meet, and other, other people that I'm going to meet, getting the word out that, hey, here's a man that can help you through this transition. Give him a call. And then I, I can go if I'm not already in the middle of something. Or maybe I can just go over there and get them started or something if they're close by. Whatever I can do to help these churches to transition and do things that need to be done, uh, we'll be available for that. So we have some advantages. We've been in the, I've been in the pastorate for a long time, so I know what goes on in the ministry. Amen. <laughs> you know, I know what goes on. I know, I know about the finances, and I know you got to look into the finances, and, and you know, I know how to run and operate the church, and, and I know the kind of messages that people need to be able to help them through a difficult time. And so all these things, through the years of experience that God has allowed me to have, I'm able to put this together and tie it together to help those churches uh, move forward for the glory of God. That's our heart's desire. That's what we would like to do for the Lord. Now, Hunterdale Baptist Church is going to be my ascending church, and they've already voted to support us financially. So we praise the Lord for that. They, I mean, they stepped up the night after I gave my resignation that I'm going to resign. I mean, I'm going to retire that morning. We had a discussion time at church, and letting them, after I preached the message, I let them ask any question they wanted to ask about the church or about us and what we were going to do. And that seemed to help them a lot. To do that. And that night, they voted to take us on as their missionary, and they voted to support us and be our sending church. So that was, that was a real blessing uh, there. And so uh, we're going to be sent out under Beacon International Baptist Missions from Johnson City, Tennessee. That's our sending board. Uh, I've served on that board as an uh, advisor uh, for 16 years. And so uh, Brother Jerry Mullendore was the uh, di first director. He's the one who founded the mission, and he was a personal friend of mine. He came to my church and preached a lot, and um, he asked me if I'd serve on the board. So at this point in time, it's been almost 17 years I've been on the board. And so I'll be resigning from the board because I'll be out serving in different capacities and serving the Lord uh, in different areas. And I'm going to sure miss those men because they have become like brothers to me uh, there as we met together, did things together. Uh, and things. Now, we face some problems. We face some problems. Did you know that 40 pastors resign or quit the ministry every week? I should say, take the word resign it. Quit the ministry every week. Did you realize that? Quit the ministry. And did you realize that 80 churches closes their, close their doors every week? Some of those churches and some of those preachers are independent, fundamental Baptist preachers and churches. And the Lord only knows we need to preserve as many as we can because there's not many of us are standing tall and strong today for the Lord. So this is, this, is, this is a great concern that I have. Okay, now, here's some things I've heard about some events that, that took place. I heard of a, uh, of a church where the preacher came in on Sunday morning turned around and faced the congregation and said, I quit and walked out. I can't, be I can't begin to imagine something like that happening. Just walking in and said, that's it, I quit, I've had it, I'm out of here, and leaves. To me, that leaves a poor testimony in the mouth of the church. The hearts are broken. So we want to go in and heal, help heal the hearts of those who are hurting. That we might be able to help the church pick up the pieces and move on for God. Secondly, I heard of a man had a fairly large church. He was he uh, he was given the benediction. He was walking down the aisle, going at the church. He was praying. He got to, he got to the back door back there, and he finished praying. Said Amen. Turned around, and faced the congregation, and said, "That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here." Uh, and he left. I just can't you know I just can't focus on that. That just uh, tears me out of frame. Now, think of this. Suppose one Sunday morning somebody walks in here and uh, walks in any church, whatever, and, uh, and people saying, have you seen the pastor? Have you seen, have you seen anybody seen the pastor? And the, and the deacon walks up here and he's got a letter in his hand. In his hand he says, dear church family, I have decided 
to give my resignation effective immediately. Boy, what do you think happens to the church then? Nobody that have to leave them. Nobody, I mean, they're probably weeping and wailing and, and, and saying, Lord, what's going on in our church? Those things actually happen. <clears throat> now, pastors leave for various reasons. Some men pass away and die as they're pastoring the church. We know that happens. All of us have witnessed and, and seen that happen. Some people retire. Some people leave due to health issues. They cannot you know, do the responsibilities of the pastor anymore, so they have to leave for health issues. Uh, others resign for various reasons. Some may be even forced out. You've heard stories about that as well, forced out. And some quit and leave abruptly. Now, most pastors leave after 30 if they go 60 days, it's, uh, that's almost a miracle in itself. But about 30 days, they stay and they move out. I can see why. When a pastor is resigning or he's going to another uh, church, he does not have time to do all the things that are necessary to get ready to bring the next pastor in because it is time consuming. I can testify to that. <laughs> You know, I was trying to pass to the church. I was looking over the pulpit's committee shoulder and trying to get everything taken care of and get, and get all this tied up uh, for the Lord. So I, I know uh, I can see now why when they leave after 30 days because they're busy packing. Have, have y'all packed lately? That's a terrible job. Y'all see me. I'm trying to unload my office now and move all my office stuff to my house. I'm about two-thirds of the way done, <laughs> you know. And the new pastor said, Brother Vincent, let's take your time. He said, I'm no hurry to get into the office or whatever. He said, whenever you can get it moved. Hey, that's a blessing, ain't it? Isn't it? Yeah. So, all right, many churches do not know what to do when the pastor is gone to get the next pastor. The head man of our pulpit committee stood up in the church the, a couple of Sundays after uh, we got everything moving, and here's what he said. He turned to me, he said, church, he said, we need to thank the pastor for staying here and helping us through this. He said, it is an undaunting task. So to see him say that, and he's there in the middle of it with me, and uh, people need some help is what I'm saying. They've got to have somebody guide them through this, uh, this kind of thing. It's because it's hard for them to go through. This is... Um, Upon receiving a call from a church that's searching for a pastor, uh, we will make arrangements to go there and be with them and um, help them to the best of our ability. Now, sometimes, some of these are small churches, and they don't have a parsonage for the pastor to stay in. They don't have some things like this that you may need. Well, God has blessed us. We have a nice camping trailer. We bought eight years ago in plans and preparations of maybe doing something like this, but we didn't know how detailed it was going to be at the time. And so we can go and stay at the church four, five, or six months at the time. We have a place to stay. All I need is some electricity. That's all I need. And I'll be able to be there to help that church and, and to do what needs to be done to help them do what needs to be done there at their church. Now, this is a crucial time. Most, time, most people do not know what to do. Uh, this is a time where churches flounder. Uh, they become stagnant. And they don't, they're just, they're, maybe they're meeting or whatever, but they just don't know what to really do. This is a time when churches lose members. They get discouraged. This is a time where the devil comes in and sows the seeds of discord. And as a result of that, the church can fall to pieces or the church can close. Um, the church, the longer the church is without a pastor, the greater deterioration takes place in the church. And that's why it's critical to get to the churches as quick as we can to help those who are in need. This causes the churches to close their doors. Church property and buildings are lost, meaning much of God's people's money has been poured into those churches and the buildings are there and they have given their hearts to establish the churches. And now because a pastor has left, the church has closed its doors because the congregation has dwindled. They can't pay the bills anymore. And so they had no choice but to close. Listen, that's not all. This might be the only testimony in town that was there. And with the doors are closed, there's no testimony for Christ there anymore. That's a tragedy. Souls, soul, winnings, soul winning is gone. No one is able to take the gospel to the local community anymore. Revivals are gone. Mission conferences are gone. The worldwide outreach is gone. The missionary support is lost. 
Church ministries are gone. Vacation Bible school, ladies' meetings, and community outreach is all gone because the doors have closed to the church. Satan wins. How sad a story is that. That once a church was thriving and now had to close its doors because the people had no leadership to get them to the next point in their church where they needed to go. Sandra and I will do all we can to help those churches to keep going for the Lord. We'll do all we can to help get a new pastor in there. But they'll be choosing the pastor. I'm just helping them. Okay? It's like I told my church. I had one vote. I said, you guys are selecting the pastor, but I'm going to help you. Why? You know, there are good preachers and there are bad preachers. There are good churches and there are bad churches. We want to get a good pastor with a good church. Amen. That's what we want to do. That's our goal. Uh, so we feel like in, with our years of experience, we can make a difference in some of those churches. So that's our heart's desire. That's our, that's our prayer. Now we have a plan. We can bring stability to the church. We can be someone that the people in the church can lean on. And uh, we can encourage the congregation. We can remind them that God is still able to do great things. That God's still all-powerful. He's still almighty. He still answers prayer. And so we, we go in and reassure them that God's still on the throne. We bring guidance and hope to the church. We stand ready to help in any way we can to help these churches as they find the next pastor. I've been blessed all these years. My wife can play the piano. She's played the piano for us all these years at our church. One of the first questions our church asked us when we got ready to leave says, who's going to play the piano for us? Yeah. Guess what? The pastor that came, his wife plays the piano. The next question they had was, who's going to run the church office? The pastor's wife can run the office. So what, what's happening? God supplied the need that we had. He did. And I believe it's, it's, it's going to work out well. All right, so we see also that um, um, I can help form a pulpit committee if they don't have one formed already. I can teach them what to look for in the resumes. I can teach them how to make telephone calls and look at the, um, the references, call the references and get the information we need. And then we compare the references that they have given us to see if anybody says anything that's different because they all get the same questions, you know. And we get to interview people that we think may be a good fit for the church through Zoom Hey, that saves the church a lot of money because churches don't have money to bring four or five preachers in there and take care of them, and at their, especially their small churches. But we can, we can talk to them through Zoom. We can see them. They can see us. And we can ask them all kinds of questions to um, get things uh, taken care of. So as we examine the candidates closely, we're praying together for God's leading in the search of the right pastor. We required, we required three or four things from them. First of all, we asked for a resume. But I didn't realize that when you send a resume in, some, half the people didn't send any references in. Ding, ding, ding. That, I already got something to hide. Didn't send the resumes in. But somebody told me that's the way they do it this day and time. So we had to type back and say, okay, here's what we need. We need some references. We need three or four references from you. We need a picture, a current picture of your family. And we need a doctrinal statement from you. And we need um, a place we can look at online to hear you preach. That's what we required. We wanted that. I'm going to take that over to when I do the ministry for the other church as well, because I think those things are important. You need to know those things as you call on people to come. We may be at a church five or six months. We don't know. We find a pastor for our church in six months. You know, but we stayed, we stayed at the work. We kept at it. We kept at it. We kept looking at things. We made calls. One thing I did learn there is if you see somebody you think might be a good fit for your church, you button that, drag your feet because another church is going to snatch him up. That was a very important lesson there. That you can't go over too fast, though, but you've got to go through it fast enough to keep letting people know that you're still interested in them so you don't go to another church if you're interested. Okay. All right. Will you pray for us? as we seek to stand in the gap for these churches so they can find their next pastor. Would you come over there and get one of our, if you haven't got one already, get one of our prayer cards and our uh, brochures there and just put on your refrigerator and pray for us. Remember, a church that closes might be the last testimony in that town or community for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want that. We want to keep those churches open to the best of our ability. Sandra and I are going to do all we can to stand in the gap to help these churches. 
So would you please keep us in your prayers? Brother Charles, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this to you and to your church family. I appreciate that ministry God's leading into, definitely. There's a great need for that ministry. Amen. So what we're going to do, I haven't forgotten about Heather and Sergio and Brother Jamie. I'm going to do that at the end. Okay? Um, all the adult missionaries, if you would, come on up and have a seat. And Brother John is, is tremendous at asking questions about their ministries. And he's going to do that. Now, what I want our folks to do, you have a brochure. Get your brochure out right now. Take your brochure out and open it to the page where the pictures of the missionaries that are in the conference, okay? And get a pen. What we did last night, I talked to the missionaries and I said, uh, you remember how, I'm talking to our people here now, you remember how we, we sometimes ask our missionaries to uh, tell us some needs that they might have, right? Now we know, missionaries, we know you have a need for prayer. Some of you have a need for support. We understand all of that. But we're asking for tangible, just one per missionary couple. One need, whether it could be ministry related, it could be personal family related, it could be something very simple, maybe they need a laptop, it might be something, need some uh, books for homeschooling, it could be the ministry itself needs some money, uh, whatever it is. But something central, I want you to, when they say that one need, I want you to write it down by the face of those missionaries in that brochure, okay? We, uh, God led me to do this, it was something we're just doing extra here. But our folks love to give and love to get involved in that, and tomorrow... We'll find out how much has come in or going to come in uh, for that, okay? Just come and see Brother Daniel or myself. If you want to do, uh, let's say if one of them had a need, set, need a set of tires for their vehicle. You might say, well, God's laid on my wife and my heart. We're going to give $100 for some tires. All right, let Brother Daniel know, and he's going to keep track of each missionary, what's going to come in. Hopefully, we'll know more by tomorrow night, Okay. All right, Brother John, it's yours. Pastor Charles, thanks for the opportunity. Missionaries, and don't let this seem ominous. I am your friend. I'm pulling for you. This is not stump the chump, okay? This is, this is just about getting into your heart. I, I don't want to see you guys give uh, pat answers or uh, just be real. Be unvarnished as you can, and, and I think the church will learn from it. And not every missionary, we're not going to ask one question and go all the way down. It'll be random. And thankfully, I took my ADD medicine. We should be staying on track somewhat. <laughs> Rolando and Hannah, and both are welcome to answer. Just one, it's up to you, okay? What pushes you to go? Um, as far as keep going at this point in our ministry or initially? Where you are right now and forward. Mm -hmm. what, there, you, you mentioned the other night there have been challenges. You mm -hmm. deal with a culture that is anti-Christian, though religious. What keeps you going? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, knowing that we are called to the ministry that we're at keeps us going. Um, I think there's multiple ways of knowing you're actually called. I think emotion is a, a one thing we often confuse for that, and that burns out real fast when emotions are no longer there, just like in any other relationship. But um, you get to the field with all the excitement of, of what's going to happen, and, uh, and big things do happen. Some things don't happen the way you want, and knowing that God has called us to the work keeps me going, whether it goes bad or good. Uh, if I didn't know that, I think I would have ran from maybe the first month. I don't know. But uh, things uh, come up. We have told several people some of our, our difficulties recently, and it's kind of like, oh, we're fighting not against just even what we started fighting against originally. We're realizing there's more things even behind that, fighting against what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, knowing that God wants us there keeps us pushing forward somehow. Amen. Hannah, do you want to speak into that a little bit too? I will add a little bit because this has been a point of struggle 
for me lately, not the ministry so much as looking at myself. And when you get into a situation like this of ministry and God takes you to the nasty depths of your own heart, you're out there, you feel forgotten and alone. Um, back home, everybody's living their lives without you. Kind of forget you exist, it seems. And uh, the people in the ministry, they don't really understand. They're not really there for you. You're there for them. And you just pour out and you pour out and you pour out and you pour out and you're just like, okay, I'm, I run out. And so what I have been learning, <clears throat> you know, knowing God himself is very important for this. Knowing who he is, knowing that he's sovereign, knowing that he's good, inexplicably and unchangeably good, is huge. But what, I'm, what I've been digging into recently is that for, I won't say every, but most attributes of God, he also has a promise attached to that. And I'm finding that, you know, God is all-powerful, but he promised me his strength. And God is good, and he has promised to make me good like him. And God is holy, which, you know, he's promised in the New Testament, I'm going to work holiness in you. And so that there is hope because I've come to a place of great hopelessness, seeing that I am completely and utterly incapable of doing any of this. Amen. And so trying to turn to God and see, not only are you amazing and wonderful, wow, look at you over there, but you've promised to work this in me too. So somehow we're going to get through this. Somehow I will grow and change and become what you planned on becoming, even though I'm incapable of that. Hmm. Well stated, Hannah. Brother Callahan, um, it's 20 years in Japan. You've served the Lord there faithfully. You have this complete change of continents, change of cultures. And, and as men, we typically don't want to talk about what makes us afraid. That's culturally not what men do in a Western culture. What scares you about this new opportunity that you have at Armed Forces? And please don't look for a pat answer to, because I won't go away. <laughs> in 1986, there was a young couple in Geese in Germany with a little daughter. Didn't know they needed God. And the wife decided she wanted to go to church, and the guy reluctantly went. And um, <clears throat> that led them to a missionary to the U.S. military that came knocking on their door on May 29, 1986, and led them both to the Lord. My fear now and has always been in the ministry is somebody not going to a couple wow. like that. Me and Susan thought we had everything. I was progressing in the military. She was a GS on base. She was progressing in her job, but we weren't complete. And God completed us. Amen. And all through the military, serving through the military, retiring, then going to Japan, my fear has always been not enough people going. And, and that's, that's the real thing. And God's brought us to AFBM in a, and I think in a progression. I was 20 years in the Army, 20 years as a missionary, and now I can help missionaries get out there and reach people like us. Uh, this world is, is just nuts. I mean, with the wokeness, the humanism, and everything else going on, there, there's couples out there that are going to drown, marriages are going to be destroyed because nobody's there to reach them. And that's my fear, letting the missionaries down and letting those families down. That's... That, that's my heart. Mrs. Callahan, do you want to speak into that a little bit too? What scares you? Just not being there, not being at the right place at the right time to help. And it's mainly the wives for me. My burden is definitely with the wives and seeing what they go through. And like the ministry that we first went into was Navy, so the wives were by themselves. So we were, I had never seen that. Uh, he was Army, he was gone, but um, 
Yeah. I, we even had one lady that visited our church just because she was looking for something positive, mm -hmm. somebody to be positive in her life because wow. there was so much negativity on, in the housing area on base. So it's just being there and being prepared, you know, and being in the center of God's will so that I know, you know, I have, I can be there for them. And, but, um, yeah, just Thank we're you. praising God. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And to be clear, in case you didn't catch it, the story you told is your story. They were the couple that was there in case, just make sure everyone understood. Brother Webster, what methods are you using on your field, where you are, to reach into the community to make a difference? Um, one thing I'd say is, is uh, the Lord, it's, it's amazing how the Lord leads you and you don't know where you're going, but then you realize, oh, okay, so this is where, yeah. God, you are bringing us. Um, it's really just everything that we've seen through Scripture, everything we've seen in from my home church through uh, being an assistant pastor. I mean, uh, just going out. I mean, just being faithful is, is you know, a major thing. But uh, I'd say there are things that we are wanting to do that we haven't been able to do just yet that I'm excited about. Things like bus ministry, uh, for instance. And right now, what, what we're doing is, is just going out and just knocking on doors and sharing the gospel with people and making that an emphasis. And uh, one thing I've, I've experienced is that when you don't make it an emphasis, it's not an emphasis. You know what I mean? When, when it's not an emphasis, it's not an emphasis. I know that sounds uh, silly, but, you know, uh, that starts with the pastor. It starts with leadership. And one emphasis we've made this year uh, is really just families serving together. And because uh, that, I mean, when's, where's the next generation where is that heart for the gospel going to come from in the, unless they're going? I remember uh, growing up at Calvary, uh, you know, I, I surrendered a call to preach when I was 14, and Pastor Gray, we had Operation Go, and uh, I remember leading my first soul to the Lord when I was 14. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's where it started, you know what I mean? And so when I, when I teach our folks how to lead somebody to the Lord, it's what I learned when I was 14, you know what I mean? And so, uh, and so really right now it's, you know, we're really just, just pushing to, to knock as many doors as we can and uh, give out the gospel as, as often as possible. One thing we, we try to emphasize too is not just going soul winning, but being a soul winner. And, uh, and really just trying to make that emphasis for everyone. That it's not just the pastor's <laughs> responsibility. It's not just uh, you know, the mature believer's responsibility or somebody in a position, it's everybody's responsibility. Because we've received the gospel, because we've been saved, we have a responsibility with the gospel. And so um, one, one prayer of ours now that we, a lot of our emphasis, well, a lot of our focus, I should say, has been on getting a place settled. And now that that's settled, uh, I told our folks on Sunday, I said, this is, it's a tool. You know, and uh, let's use it. You know what I mean? Let's do everything that we can to to use this to get the gospel out. And that's that's our, our main focus. So one prayer of mine is that uh, we haven't been in a position to have transportation, like a bus ministry or something like that it, it, it yet. Um, and when you're meeting at a hotel, there's just some difficulties there as to, as to, to how to facilitate that. Um, but one desire I have is this year is to create the need for it. You know, like meet enough people where sure. that we're inviting to church that need a ride to church sure. where we as a church realize we need a bus. You know, mm -hmm. we need not just to have a token ministry, but that that's one thing as I look in. I know I'm probably probably rambling at this point, but uh, that's one thing as I look at Newport News is a huge opportunity is the bus ministry. Um, and that's really a heart that that I have because I've seen it. I've seen it work, and you know we invite folks. We we work hard at getting folks to come, 
and uh, <clears throat> they don't they don't always come you know in fact that very seldom do they come even with promises and offers to ride you know give them a ride and all sorts of things but what I have seen is a lot of those same families would send their kids okay. and uh, and so that's that's really something that I I have a, a burden for that I would love to see happen soon and uh, like I said just by creating the need by getting the gospel out and going out and being faithful and, uh, and so that's that's really been uh, you know I think our main uh, thrust or moving sure. forward but. <clears throat> Ashley when you look at yourself you're a an American church planter's wife what's that like um, it's interesting because you do have some elements of that missionary feeling especially when you're away from family but you also have the comforts of being in America and things being simpler that way um, I know that for my husband and I I just feel like not every wife is on board with every ministry I mean at least in my experience I've seen that and when we got married it was just something we committed a long time ago that we were going to do everything together um, so we try to do everything together. I mean, we try to clean the church together. We prepare for Sunday together. We um, do all of those things. Sermon preparation. Yeah. yeah. I write it. it. No. We all got that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, is, it is a different experience. Also, like making the transition from being church planter's wife to pastor's wife, because that is something yeah. that you know, we also have to feel ownership of the church, where it's not just like we planted this year, but now this is what we're caretaking. Sounds, right. And so that has been, I feel like the last year, that's sort of been my journey a little bit, is understanding the ladies of our church and what their needs are and praying for them specifically and trying to keep up with them individually and um, just kind of caring for those ministries as like being a female trying to care for the female needs of the church um, I am the nursery director and I've done that for a long time and so I feel like that comes with the territory doing secretarial things kind of comes with the territory um, but as far as being the church planter's wife I just feel like trying to show the ladies that I'm a real person and I'm just like them and they're just like me and I want them to have a strong relationship with the Lord. I mean, that's really the goal, so that they can then, you know, yeah. help keep the spirit of their homes deeply rooted in Christ and witness to people that they have influence over. Um, it's it's been definitely a learning process, and I I think the greatest thing the Lord has taught me, at least in the last year specifically, is there's a difference in patience and waiting. And I do feel like through COVID, we were just like waiting. I mean, I felt inside like I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for this to be over. And it's like the Lord was teaching me, no, you're in the waiting room, but you have to be patient. And this is what you need to learn in your time of patience. Amen. And so um, getting through COVID and kind of being on the other side in our community, because specifically in Newport News, the COVID thing was very strong. I mean, people were wearing masks, people were angry if you weren't wearing a mask, people were, um, it was a struggle, which I'm, I'm sure some other people that are up here have obviously dealt with that in a big way. And so um, it was just something that I had to learn and kind of grow through and and feel responsible for our church for in that time, too. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Vincent, are you ready? <laughs> when you think about everything that your husband and you are doing, just recently called to do days old okay days old what excites you I feel like what we're getting ready to do now is just going to be really different yeah from what we have done for the last 46 years yeah um, we're excited right we're meeting new people hopefully introducing some new concepts and whatever yeah. um, it is a little scary of because course. we don't know what to expect. Right. You know, so um, I'm excited about it. I really am. And uh, I went with him to that conference at Ambassador that right. day. And we had a long ride home, about six hours worth. Sure. And we talked a lot yeah. <laughs> on the way home about the possibilities. And it's something that we have been talking about for years 
but we couldn't go through with it because of so many circumstances that had come up. Sure. One of them being COVID. Yeah. Um, so now it's really happening um, and it, it's exciting. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to uh, working with some different ladies, hopefully being able to do things with music because sure. that's, that's music is my yeah. my thing. Well. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to going along with him wherever he takes me. Uh, yeah. I'll be right there and I'll be right there helping him doing whatever we can do. Amen. Brother Vincent, I know that God's called you to do this and he's uniquely prepared. You took time tonight to share with us everything that you plan on doing. But when you look at that, where do you see your ministry in five years? Doing the same thing. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Very good. Yes, sir. I hope we're, we're both in pretty good health. Yeah. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do this at least 10 years. Right. And hopefully if we can, our, my goal is that if I can transition two churches every year, with God's help and His grace, hopefully we can transition 20 churches in my 10 years that I have to do this. If I can go a little longer, I will. That's all in God's hands. Sure. But that's, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it right now. Amen. You know, church, when you hear about people retiring and getting ready to do the next thing in their life, can you imagine that, and not to speak of your age in a negative context, it's the reality of where we are, but to say that you're at this age and you're saying, let's go help 20 churches in the next season of our ministry. That's powerful. That's an inspiration as well. Brother um, Matthew Henry, I, there was a reason I associated your name with someone else's Matthew Henry. I read the book. I have some conclusions that, <laughs> that I took. But uh, anyhow, when did you first become exposed to missionary work? Well, after getting saved in 1973, uh, I felt the call, God's calling in 1975. At the time, my now father-in-law, the missionary, Dr. J. R. Lauren, Gary Kamakula Robert Lauren, I was saved in those uh, youth retreat conducted by him. So I did go to him and told him that uh, God called me to preach. Mm -hmm. So seeing his work, what he did, inspired me to do God's work. Amen. Mrs. Henry, may I ask you a question as well? When you look at yourself as an Indian woman and you come here to America and you see American Christianity and you see Indian Christianity. It's, it's one faith, we know that. But culture is a wrapper that goes around our faith. What do you see as the differences between, and this, I, I'm not asking you to be critical or kind, I'm just asking you to be honest. When you look at American Christian women and you look at Indian Christian women, what stands out to you? And if that is too difficult, just say, I would prefer not to answer, and that's fine. Well, in a way, it is. Okay. okay. Then, would you share with us when you got saved? I was saved in, in one of the conferences which my dad held in the youth retreat, and... Um, one of the messages which he spoke from the pulpit, I was kind of frightened because it was about something about hell, and it's it's in the scriptures. It says that the worm dieth not. Yes. And I said, you know, if I see any bugs in the house inside or outside, I just kill it. <laughs> and so uh, that shook me up, and I said, I'm going to sit in the last chair so that. When the Holy Spirit was working within the kids, all the kids were crying. And I didn't like a lot of crying or anything. So I just sat right outside in the corner and 
I was just listening. You know, this, this verse just shook me real hard for three days. And maybe on the last day, I got saved. Amen. Amen. And so who reached your father? And the, the, was it, were American missionaries involved in bringing the gospel to your family members that were responsible for that? Is that where it came from? Or were you just, you didn't grow up Hindu? And no, sir. I grew up in a Christian family. Okay. And um, his parents also. The same. They are Christians, yeah. Good. I to learn. Uh, there was a church, a Baptist church, he used to attend. But he was a nominal. Mm -hmm. Though he heard the gospel many, many times, but he studied uh, uh, very higher studies like uh, BCom honors and then MA, Master of Arts. He got a good job in Nizam government in Hyderabad uh, as an accountant. While he's working as an accountant, then God uh, spoke to him that he's on his way to hell. Mm. And he, because he got all the <laughs> messages in the past, yes. all came to him and he accepted the Lord. Amen. To God be the glory. Yes, sir. Amen. Brother Cattell? Yes, sir. What did you do in your life before you became the church planter there? How were you actively involved in church that helped you get ready for this? Um, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I wasn't here. Amen. <laughs> I, I would have told you that you were crazy if you thought For we sure. were going to be church planners yeah. or I was going to be a pastor. I think my pastor would have said I was going to be crazy. <laughs> Amen. But um, really, I just wanted to be faithful. The uh, Bible yeah. talks about a uh, steward being found faithful. Yes, sir. And I, I was taught at a young age to be faithful, to be loyal. I probably failed miserably at that pastor, but um, I always wanted to be a help to my pastor, and I always wanted to serve the Lord. At a young age, I got saved when I was eight, and my, my dad, after my mom passed away in 2015, it shook our whole family up. Yeah. And um, I remember my dad talking with me, and uh, he said, Jeremiah, all through your growing up, we saw evidence of the Spirit convicting you. And I had a, I never wanted to be at odds or with a guilty conscience. And so I, I just got busy. I like to work. Um, the Bible talks a lot about a sluggard. The Bible talks about the slothful man. And so I wanted to be busy. And so I always look for where can I help? What can I do? I never did it with the intention of ever being a pastor or ever being a church planner. I just wanted to be a help. God opened the door in uh, 2009. We were in a little church up in Wisconsin, and uh, we were in Bridgewater Baptist Church. And my pastor at that time came to me and he said, Jeremiah, what's God doing in your life? That's one of the scariest questions in the world. To me, it was. And I said, well, I said, I, I, I just want to serve. And he said, well, is, uh, you ever thought about preaching? And I said, well, I've thought about it. He said, good, you're going to preach on Wednesday. <laughs> Scared out of my mind. Um, I got up and preached my first sermon out of Psalm 91, Psalm of Protection. Then God allowed my wife and I to work with the teens at that church and start working with the children's ministry. We had a burden for children. We were praying that God would give us children. The church here knows how we prayed for children and we lost, uh, we've lost five, but we were praying and God gave us five beautiful children. 
And um, when we moved here for the military, my only prayer was, God, use us. I just want to be used. And I remember we had a mutual friend, Brother David Dean, came over to my house, put carpet in my house, and he said, I know a pastor. And I said, yeah. He said, up in, up in uh, Yorktown, Virginia. I said, nope. We're not going up there. He said, his name's John Charles, Pastor John Charles. Nope, we're not going up there. I remember you called me, Pastor. And we came up here, and my only prayer was, Lord, use us. And God opened the door here, Pastor, through you. And even later on, I think the one big thing I would say was just don't quit. Lord put us through some really, really difficult times. Um, we spent seven wonderful years here. And then God allowed us to go be an interim pastor of a church that was without a pastor. And um, had been without a pastor for quite some time. Turmoil had set in. They were tearing each other apart. And they turned that anger when we got there. I just preached the word. That's what the Bible says, preach the word. They turned that anger towards our family. We were hurt. We got, for lack of a better way to say it, we got run out of that church. God allowed us to go to another church, and with the blessing of my pastor. And um, we're there faithfully, and we got hurt. And everything inside of you says, quit, quit, quit. But the Bible says, quit you like men. Don't quit. I came home, it was a Saturday. We were used to going out, telling people about Jesus Christ, going soul winning. And I remember my wife was on her way to come soul winning. I was coming home because I'd just been thrown out of a church. And she said, what do we do? I said, I don't know. I said, but I do know this. The Bible says press toward the mark. Fight the good fight. I said, everything inside of me says to quit. But God says, keep moving forward. And I said, if there's one thing I know, the most dangerous place for me and my family right now would be out of church. The safest place for me and my family is in church, under the preaching of the Word of God. God led us to uh, Chesapeake Baptist Church at that time, and uh, we never went there intending to be a church planner. We never went there intending to, we just didn't know at that point. We were very shooken. Uh, shaken? Shooken? Whatever that word is. It all works. We were shook up. <clears throat> our, our faith was tried. And um, one year later, November, 19th, November 3rd, 2019, we had our very first service, Planet Anchor Baptist Church. And it was such a whirlwind for us. Uh, but no doubt it's where God wants us. No doubt that God kept us in Portsmouth. <laughs> All those years, Pastor, that we were here praying that God would burn our house down, <laughs> actually prayed that. And uh, the church here knows it. I'll never forget that evangelist that came here, Pastor. We were sitting on that front pew over there. He got up and he said, Son, your house could be burning right now. I, I said, Praise God. <laughs> burn it down. But that's just because we didn't want to be in Portsmouth. It was our Nineveh. But God broke our hearts, and we now, it's our home. The people of Portsmouth are our family. And God was preparing, uh, putting a family through a rough time because he had a rough ministry for us. But it's the best ministry because it's where God has us. Amen. Mrs. Cattell. You seem very nervous by the very mention of your name. 
you married a warrior with an indomitable spirit. It's evident from his testimony. You were Navy wife? Yes, sir. And you dealt with absences as he served our country's interests abroad. That means that when hurts came, you had to absorb them, take the hits, keep moving. When the hits come from the ministry, it hurts deeply twice. Once because they're attacking your guy, and the other is you bear the hurt for your kids, and meanwhile you have to manage your own hurt for your heart. With all of that said, How do you manage? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> first, I need to find a quiet place for myself just where I can um, sit alone and just not think about what's going on around me because it can be very overwhelming. Um, <clears throat> and I like to just sit down and pray by myself and spend time uh, talking to God and asking him how to get me out of the situation or um, just to seek God's counsel and where to go to. Um, a lot of times I go back and I refer to some of the books that I have from pastor's wives of the past. Um, Kathy Rice is one of them. Mm. And just going back and rereading their stories and how their husbands were in the ministry for decades and saw a lot of different things and um, just getting that reminder from other pastor's wives that everything will be okay and just to keep going and not quit. This is the only follow-up one I've done thus far, so <laughs> please don't be too nervous. Okay. How long have you guys been married? Uh, this September, 20 years. So go back 20 years with me. Did you see tonight? No, <laughs> not at all. What did you see? Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> um, I was not saved when we got married. We were 18. And so the ministry was not even, not even a thought at all. Um, he was getting ready to go to boot camp uh, right before we got married, and so um, I guess our goals at that time was just let's do four years in the military, and then he's going to get out, and we're going to stay in Wisconsin and do something. I don't know, go to college. I don't know. We didn't really have long-term goals at that point at 18, right. um, just finishing out four years in the military, but here we are 20 years later retiring from the military and full-time in the ministry and I never would have guessed that that's how our life would be or that we have five beautiful children um, as well and um, but I'm glad and I'm thankful that that is how the Lord worked out um, our lives together it hasn't been easy in the military um, but I'm very thankful for the life that we have had and the roads that we've had to travel down together you seem to have a steel to resolve, and that's why I pushed in a little harder, and I, I hope I didn't put you too much on the spot. No. I want to come down the line here, and this is a question for which you just need to kind of figure it out, okay? But everybody gets the same question. Each of you serve in missions in some capacity. Who is your favorite missionary? Where whomever raises their hand first I'll start there and go to the other direction okay of course in the middle great now I have to choose left or right I'll look for who looks the most nervous <laughs> brother could tell favorite missionary um, my favorite missionary is actually a current missionary and um, and that's great I think it's because my heart has been knit to him um, pastor Christopher Faulkner uh, he's over in Sardinia, Italy. Sardinia is a island of 1.3, 1.6 million people, somewhere in there. And uh, they've never 
had the gospel. Ever. That is the first Bible-believing church that has ever been planted on that island. That island has been forgotten. Um, Italy doesn't even claim it. They don't claim it as Italy. They don't put it on their maps. They literally, the island doesn't exist. It's, it's a looks like a soccer ball off the end of the boot. And Italy, if you buy a world map, you'll find it. But if you go to Italy and buy a map, it's not there. He had spent 17 years working in the naval shipyard. God called him to plant a church in Italy. Amazing how God works. His wife is from uh, Catania, Italy. And um, I've been there. <laughs> he quit his job the right way uh, after 17 years. He was in an he was very advanced in his position of leadership. Um, he had a lot of men underneath him, a fantastic leader, but a godly man and a godly husband. And watching, being able to firsthand watch his family leave everything they know, everything that's comfortable, and go in the right before COVID hit, they never went on deputation. They stepped out in faith, believing that God wanted them there, wow. and they went. And now they're getting ready to get a larger building. They average about 35 to 40 on a Sunday morning. Wow. They're, it's just a miracle. Sure how God has worked. The Ukraine incident, what's going on in Ukraine right now, they're sending the Ukrainian refugees to, Sar or to Sardinia, Italy. They've got people in their church from Ukraine, people whose family members have been bombed and killed. Mm. They've got a, a Ukrainian woman that's pregnant. Her mother was killed in, in one of those bombings. Um, Watching the resolve of a family right now. I can read about great missionaries of the past, praise God, but seeing it sure. and having the privilege to support them and be a part of it from our church. And I told our church, when we planted our church, I said the heartbeat of God is reaching people with the gospel. Sure. And though we have a responsibility here, We'd be fools not to be involved elsewhere as well. Amen. And I was told by many people, you're not old enough as a church to do that. And I said, well, I read about this man in the Bible named Stephanus. The Bible says Stephanus was of the first fruits of Achaia. He was one of the first Christians, one of the first converts in a city of Greece called Achaia. And what we know about Stephanus is a little, little sentence it says that Stephanus and his house addicted themselves with the ministering of the saints. And Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, when they come, you submit yourself to them because they did your part. He said, when you didn't do your part as a church, he said, this house picked up your slack. And so we've taken that very literally that we don't wait. We need to be involved in worldwide missions. We need to be as a baby church plant. There is no such thing as a time. I believe God just wants us to do it in faith. Amen. And so we've had the privilege to support not only Pastor Chris Faulkner, but a church plant down in Elizabeth City. And I'm um, very excited about what God's doing down there. Good. And uh, so, yes, sir. A church, I want you to take note of the names that are mentioned here, both living and deceased when you hear them, because these are the books that you should be surrounding your kids with to make sure that they have the right. Mrs. Mrs. Cattell, do you have a, a missionary that comes to mind for you? For a favorite missionary? Yes, ma'am. And if you don't, it's okay too. I, I don't want to press anybody. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of one right that's, now. That's no problem. There's no pressure there at all. Um, Brother Webster, we'll start with you. I'm hopefully going to take my wife's answer so she doesn't Stop. do the I'm just Then let her go first. Okay. That way you have to struggle. <laughs> I would say mine is Amy Carmichael, um, mm. just because, <laughs> because, because um, I grew up in a house of girls and raising daughters in the ministry. I never want them to believe that getting married is the only job that they'll ever have or the wow. only way that they can serve the Lord. Wow. The longer that we're in the ministry and the more people that we know, the more we see tragic marriages sometimes. And I tell them all the time, I'd rather not have grandchildren and raise an Amy Carmichael than someone who gets tangled up in something that's not pleasing to the Lord. Wow. So I admire what she did because she rescued children. I mean, it was, it was the lowest of the low in India and the things that she did were very difficult and she risked her life at every turn. And I love the story of um, how she always wanted blue eyes and then she realized why God gave her brown. Um, you know, and just because sometimes you hear your little girls say things like that, like, I wish I had this color hair, I wish I looked like this. Mm. And, you know, it's good for them to understand that God made them a complete and whole person Amen. the way that he made them. And then there's another missionary that I love. Um, I believe her first name is Helen, but her last name is Rosevere. And she wrote a small book called Enough. Mm. And it is, it's an amazing life-changing book. And it just talks about the sufficiency of Christ Amen. and how everything was against her and her whole family did not want her to you know be a missionary and she just had to learn the hard way that those people did not call her to them they didn't care that she was there but she knew that it god was worth serving regardless amen. so amen she's special brother webster um i'd say william borden was mm. was definitely one you know, somebody that didn't even make it to the mission field right. mm -hmm. but the, the thing that, and I, I've used it as sermon illustrations before, and you know, uh, but what I appreciate about it, his testimony is the fact that he wasn't waiting to get to the mission field to serve the Lord, mm. you know, and uh, that I've, I've, I struggled with that, you know, as uh, going through Bible college, I remember uh, being very frustrated, you know, with the idea of I would just want to go I want to I want to start you know and feeling like you can't start yet and I remember working uh, at a valvoline changing oil uh, for a living and uh, just coming home and telling my wife what, what am I even doing you know sure. what is this you know the Lord's called me to preach why am I even here and uh, and it was kind of the Lord just smote my heart mm -hmm. you know why, why are you waiting to serve me Amen. you know what i mean why are you waiting to mm -hmm. and so it really changed a lot for me just mm -hmm. to realize that god's will is not in the future you know mm -hmm. it's that's today right. that's and right. uh and what we do today will determine what we will yeah. eventually be <laughs> what we considered the future sure. uh, but it's always today mm -hmm. and so that's something that uh continues to challenge me uh, just in the idea that, you know, we can get thinking about plans in the future, but those things don't happen if you don't start today. And so, and that's, that's why I appreciate his testimony so much is the fact that all throughout his time and preparation for the mission field, he was serving Amen. and he was witnessing and he was doing. And so church, you have Helen Rosevere. I'm going to finish down here and lap back around here. Helen Rosevere, Amy Carmichael, William Borden. So get those names down. You can look on Amazon, Google them, and you'll see some of their stories. Hannah. Well, that's a hard decision because my mother <laughs> had a ton of biographies. That was one of her things that she did for us was make sure we had biographies. So you read about Amy Carmichael, Mary Slessor, and Gladys Allward, especially as a girl, you want to read sure. all the ladies' ones. The girl ones yeah. But then you read about all the men. It's like, wow. But if I had to bring it down, well, I have the privilege of living with my favorite missionary. All right. Most of you have the privilege of meeting him. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But um, I'm going to try not to sound super spiritual here. But Just be yourself, Hannah. Honestly, after reading all of the dozens of biographies, the one that's made the most impact, has mattered most to my heart, has been seeing Jesus as a missionary. 
Mm. And anytime you see what you're going through and you turn to the scriptures and see what he went through, yeah. it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Everything he left behind, the loneliness that he had to pass through, even God the Father himself forsook him for at least those few hours. And the utter submission that he shows us, especially being the wife, and I know the men have to submit too, to um, Christ as the head of the husband, but um, it's our particular curse <laughs> to not like that. And so learning from Christ how to submit, and you think, wow, if you look through John especially, and how he just does everything the Father says to do. He doesn't do anything that's outside of the Father's will. And then you watch how he loves people and how he is crushed to bits. And you're like, I'm not going through anything. And Christ is like the ultimate missionary to look at and say, no matter what I've passed through, it's right there. Amen. And he's gone through all of it for me to give me an example that, and again, he did it all, but then he turns around, he promises, you know, hey, I went through it, and I'm going to give you this strength. Sure. I'm omnipresent, but that doesn't mean I'm just everywhere. I am here for you Amen. in this time. And it just turns everything around to minister directly to your soul, and it surpasses everything. Amen. But well, Rolando, whatever you share <coughs> after this is anticlimactic. We went, <laughs> we went straight to Jesus. Had to beat him to it. <laughs> Yeah, well. But if I could add. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, you're fine. Okay. If I could add, George Mueller is another book you want to get because mm. that's impacted us greatly. Did I steal that from you? Hopefully not. <laughs> that was a big impact, humanly speaking. George Mueller was huge for me in seeing that just absolute trust in God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to ask people for stuff. I'm not going right. to tell you and broadcast my needs and, hey, hey, I need this much money. Just God will do it. Yeah. Amen. And that's made a big difference for us in our ministry too. Amen. I'm going to mention that it tends to be that as you go through different stages of life, different missionaries strike you differently because now all of a sudden you kind of feel like you know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I was talking about this in Missionary Family Week. One that recently uh, impacted me was uh, Northern Iraq missionary that uh, as far as human um, exito and success goes, this man was would have been the hero of absolutely everybody if he just reported what he accomplished in a revival that happened in that area. And uh, he didn't, though. I, I really believe uh, what strikes me most about this particular missionary, the anticlimactic one, <laughs> but... Uh, was that he was real. He, he mentioned his greatest failures. Um, he, he mentioned that he didn't just go on, well, there was a revival and we saw people saved and this happened and this happened. He said, basically, in recording, uh, I've, I've always thought that biographies are great, but no one really knows what other people have been through or what they really are at heart, what they think, and uh, God alone and that person has to deal with the dark side of all that. Um, autobiographies are rarely true because no one really wants to tell on everything they did wrong. I mean, if I just reported, if I was given three hours to report my mistakes in the last five years, it would be an ugly, you'd be like, why did we send him, you know? <laughs> but uh, this particular missionary, you all know, actually, so you, your kids probably already read his biography. Uh, I really believe he did write his own book, Jonah. Um, he he goes from his racism, his materialism, his um, his egoism, his all these problems that he has, and God turns this around, and there's a revival mm -hmm. that is the biggest revival in that area in the world. And uh, you could say, "Wow, Jonah!" But you read his story, and you're like, "Whoa." But uh, Jonah isn't the hero of his story. It's not about the great. It talks about a lot of big things in, in the book of Jonah, but the biggest thing isn't Jonah. It's the God of Jonah. And uh, dealing with my own self in that story has helped me because then I look at myself and I say, well, now I'm not 
I, I didn't go to Mexico and like, oh, God, just destroy them, you know, why am I here? That wasn't, that wasn't the connection, but I realized, you know, there's a lot so applicable from his humanness dealing with uh, the difficulties. And when someone really hurts, and Syria did really hurt Israel in many ways, it's hard to love them, and we've had people really hurt us, and it's really hard to love them, and there's a sense that you, you might be tempted to go. Yeah. Uh, against them, but just realizing what makes you happy, one of the things that struck me is what makes you happy, what makes you sad really tells you what you are, and Jonah was happy about something material, and sad, in fact mad about something spiritual and a great accomplishment, and I think we're often so frustrated when something material breaks down in our life, but we don't bat an eye about how many souls are going to hell. And so really, Jonah's a lot more close to us than we often realize. And he started in, uh, I think, in Kings chapter 14 as a very famous prophet because the Bible says, and many people miss this part because you read Jonah and he doesn't refer back to that, but it says that he prophesied in the time of Jeroboam II that God would expand the borders of Israel, a king who did what's wrong, which, what's evil in the sight of the Lord, a country that was rebelling against God, and God sent a prosperity message. So he had to be popular. But God showed him his heart. And by showing him his heart, uh, he helped me to analyze my own problems and then contrast him with uh, the one greater than Jonah Amen. and see that that's the only reason I'm going to get through. Amen. Thank you. Brother Callahan. Uh, in 1986, we were saved. I was 29 years old. Did not grow up in church, so I had none of this knowledge. But in 1995, when um, God called us to Japan, this name started coming up, Laverne Rogers. And Laverne Rogers um, <coughs> accepted MacArthur's call of 1,500 missionaries. And in 1950, February, he arrived in Japan to be a missionary with his uh, college roommate. Uh, they were the, some of the first um, approved missionaries in 1949. But he, he became a missionary there in 1950. And uh, when we started going to Japan, I was naive about so many things. And, and we had contacted a church in Zama. And the missionary there said, well, I, a lot of people said they were coming to Japan. Nobody ever shows up. And he, he just didn't want anything to do with us. Well, God put us in a situation where I was at a church uh, in Pennsylvania, going to church in West Virginia, and had a church, uh, time in the middle uh, free. So I contacted this church. He said, hey, we're having a missions conference. Come to our missions conference. The missionary's son was the song leader at that church. Mm. He called his dad said, Dad, these people are real. They're coming. Well, Laverne Rogers is huge in Japan. I mean, 18 churches started, still going today, all 18 churches. And uh, so he's big in Japan. He calls me and asks me if he, if, I, if he would be able to sponsor me in Japan. I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't know I needed one. He said, could I sponsor you? I said, yes, sir. So I got to talk to him. Well, we get to Japan, take over this church, and I get to meet Laverne Rogers. And uh, mo one of the most humble men I've ever met in my life. When he talked about starting churches, he talked about it as we started a church. Right. God was in this thing and all these things. And, um, and he preached to me the greatest message I've ever heard. We were at, believe it or not, Frisch's Big Boys in Tokyo, Japan. It's not your kind of big boys. It was a Japanese big boy. Yeah. And I sit there and said, look, Vern Rogers, you got here. This place was bombed out mess. I mean, there was nothing. Phone lines were messed up. Economy was messed up. Everything was messed up. How, what did you do without cell phones and emails and internet and stuff? And he goes, knocked doors, won souls, and built churches. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I went to the altar right there. Yeah. And he, he just taught me very simply, just keeping the ministry simple, and God will do great things. Amen. Laverne Amen. Rogers retired last year. Wow. After 72 years on the mission field. Wow. The reason he came off the field is he has early onset of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. He'll be 95 years old this year. How about that? He started his last church in his 80s. And getting to know him and sitting down and having dinner with him and him preaching in our church and, and just, uh, he, he was just somebody that didn't want any credit but wanted all the credit to go to God. And he was most, one of the most humble men I've ever met. 
So I got to meet my hero. And uh, he became my hero just by meeting him. Amen. And uh, so he's just a great guy. He buried two uh, wives on the field. And, and the last time I saw him, he was smiling and still praising God. Amen. Amen. I know we need to get to everybody's uh, need, and we need to let everybody go home. I find this thrilling <laughs> to hear, and I hope everybody is just hanging in there with us. But if we could briefly finish as we have the next five share their missionary, favorite missionary, that would help me a lot. I Mrs. Really, Callahan? I really was good. That's what we were sitting here talking. I was going to say Laverne Rogers. So I have nothing more to add except for praise the Lord for the wives of these pastors, these missionaries. My burden is for the women, the military men, their wives, um, the support that they need, the men sure. need, and as a pastor, the prayer support that you need. Is, it's just amazing to me. So that I do, Laverne Rogers was who I was going to say. Amen. Okay. Is there a book on his life? I, I've there's never a, heard his name. Well, there's two little books. Um, they're uh, missionaries and stuff. He's in one of those. Wow. But uh, okay. he, he was supposed to write his autobiography, but he was like, nobody's interested in my life. Sure. That's who well, he was. Maybe you could tell me what the names of those books are after, you know, or tomorrow or whatever, if you know that. Yep. Mrs. Vincent, do you have one? Um, I guess probably, um, you know, we've read stories of missionaries, seen films of missionaries. Mm -hmm. But over the 46 years that my husband and I have pastored the church, mm -hmm. we have seen so many missionaries mm -hmm. come through the church. Mm -hmm. And we have one couple that, and these are modern, these are not the ones from way back. These are people serving the Lord now sure. that have been in Bolivia, no, Brazil for probably 45 years, close to 45 years. And they've started, I think, three churches there. They have a ranch there, a conference center, and they're doing a wonderful job. Amen. But probably one that I admire because he is such a humble, fantastic man, not putting my husband down at all, okay? <laughs> that I saw this man, and you would know him, Elwood Hurst. He was, a, he was a godly man, yes, loved the Lord, went to the island, the Micronesian Islands, and was there for quite a few years serving the Lord. And I admire that he stayed there yes. even when things got tough for him. Sure. And he ended up having to come home, not of his choice. His right. wife has Alzheimer's really bad. And he still wants to get out there and serve the Lord, yes. but he's hindered right now. Amen. And he's a man to be admired. Mm. Absolutely. and looked up to because he, he stuck with it. He didn't quit. Amen. I agree. At, at 80 years old, he told Brother Whetstone, he said, I think I have one more church plant in me, and that was at 80. Amen. And he did, and Brother Vincent. Well, I like Hudson Taylor. Mm. And I like, uh, I can't call his name there, but the one of the ladies down here talked about him. The guy that had the orphanage over in England. George yeah, Muriel, Muriel, yes. yes. And the reason I like those two guys is because they knew how to pray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the things they prayed for came to pass. Um, Hudson Taylor prayed for so many missionaries, and God sent him twice what he prayed for. He asked for some money to do the work he had to do, and God sent him twice what he asked for. Um, you've got to be walking with God to have your prayers answered like yes. that. Yes, sir. I saw uh, I, I, I saw a film on uh, Mueller many years ago. Yeah. He sat down with the children at the orphanage, had no food to give them. Right. They all held hands around the table. He blessed the food they were going to eat. Mm. And a milk wagon broke down outside of their orphanage, and the man knocked on the door and said, Mr. Mueller, would y'all like to have some milk today? He said, I can't get the milk to where it's got to go. He said, I'm going to donate it to the orphanage. And not far behind, somebody knocked on the door and had all kinds of bread that he was going to give to the orphanage. A man prayed, believing God could do something special. Amen. And those, those two guys have a special place in my heart because they had a right kind of relationship with God. They could talk to God. They did. And God heard their prayers and answered them almost immediately. Yeah. George Mueller, great, great. If you can find books uh, on him, that's great. Brother. Um, well, uh, William Carey. 
who came oh, to India. Of course, yeah. Even though the church didn't uh, interested to send him, even though he has many problems with his wife and children and health problems, so many problems uh, with the British government and uh, the people in Calcutta, but still he continued the work. Yes. Learned 40 different languages, translated into either in part or full all the 40, 40 languages in India. It's amazing. Yes, sir. Mrs. Henry, anything you would like to add? I mean, I read a book about a lady called Ida Scudder. She came from the United States to India and she set up a work, a hospital, a mission hospital in India. It's in Chennai, Madras. It's called Velour and um, it's called CMC Hospital, Christian Mission Hospital. And um, all patients from all over the Indian India, they come there and they get treated and uh, they sing songs and they give them the medicine and everything. I mean, it's, it's a real Christian good hospital, which we don't have in India. And she started that. And um, that was a nice testimony about Indians because many of the Indian la ladies, they don't go to the hospital where a man works as a doctor. And these Hindu communities, they don't allow. So she saw that pain and agony, and she returned to the States and finished her medicine, and she came back to India. Oh. And she started a hospital over there. And uh, it was in that hospital that my mom was treated for cancer, and uh, she maybe survived for seven years. Mm. And um, the doctor who had an operation done on her was called Dr. Adams, and he performed well. But mm. she died of intestinal cancer after seven years, and she went to be with the Lord. And the name of the lady who started the hospital again, please? Ida Scudder. Edith Cutter. Ida, I-D-A. I, I, okay, yeah, I-D-A. Just to add, uh, her father was a doctor. When he was in the, as a missionary in India, midnight, two husbands came saying that uh, their uh, wives are about to get delivery, but they're in pain. Is there any lady doctor here? He said, no, I, I'm the doctor, I can come. No, in India, uh, only lady doctor can touch a lady. She saw that. Actually, she's not interested in doc, do, uh, doing doctorates. But she went, after seeing that, she went back, came back to U.S. and studied medicine, came back to India and started this hospital. Mm. This is one of the famous hospitals in India right now. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord. Amen. Church family, thank you for your patience in listening. I pray this has been a help to you. Pastor Charles asked me to ask each missionary family, we'll just ask the husbands to take care of this if we could please, and to be as brief as possible, and do not fear modesty of asking. You've been asked to tell what immediate need you might have. We know there's the need of support. We know there's the need of prayer. Please omit those and just deal with just the specific question about this, Brother Callahan. Is there a need that you currently have and you could briefly share with us? Well, in my new ministry, I'm going to be representing Armed Forces Baptist Missions, which means sometimes I'll be putting on the uniform at certain functions and stuff. And I'm really upset because 15 years ago, I put my uniform on in a fit and I just put it on and it shrunk. So I need a new uniform. What does that cost? I have no idea. Uh, probably between five and $600. Mm -hmm. And that's a guess for my part, maybe a little bit more. Maybe the larger sizes are more, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the shoes, the okay, shoes, the shoes, shoes. Yeah. So there's a genuine need. This is a, uh, a moment of impact for his ministry. Yeah. Let's remember that. Brother Vincent, is there a specific need that you would like to mention tonight? Yes, sir. Um, if we have to go to some churches and stay for a long period of time, we'll need to pull our camper. I don't know how far to go to 
uh, state these churches. Uh, my camper this year is eight years old, but still a nice camper. And then we're going to have to have some new tires to go on our camper. It takes four tires to go on there. Um, that's that's the biggest thing that we need at this point so in time. About six to eight hundred dollars for four tires. I think it's the lady told me uh, it was seven hundred and fifty-three dollars out the door. She said. Okay. All right. Brother Henry, is there a need that your ministry has that you would like to share with the church? Well, just before coming to this country, the desktop in my office gone twice dead. <laughs> it's plucked up by the roots too? Or <laughs> <laughs> it's very old. Uh, I cannot take a desk desktop from this country, but sure. I saw in Amazon that there is a mini computer, which is like palm, palm size. Yes. And if, if if I can buy that, I can hook up monitors mm -hmm. and uh, maybe the keyboard and stuff in India. And the price I saw that uh, two days ago is I think three hundred and sixty-four dollars for right. that for that mini uh, computer. All right. So thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate that, Brother Cattell, Is there a need that you know of that you'd like to share? Yes, sir. Um, our need would be for the ministry. Uh, we, with our expansion, with our church growth, uh, we are going to be getting rid of our pews. And our pews were donated to the church. Our pews uh, were, you know, 20 years old. Uh, the church that gave them to us, they were kind of falling apart, but praise God, they were seating. Uh, but uh, with a small church, your space is crucial. And everything that you do, we have to be able to maneuver things around for different functions. Uh, we don't have a designated, we have a sanctuary, but it's not our designated sanctuary. It's also our meeting hall, it's for our youth rallies, it's for our uh, revivals, it's for everything. It's banquet hall, so you have to move things. We don't have a place to put our pews, so we're going to be transitioning to chairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is going to be with the new sanctuary. We're going to go to chairs and go away from the pews as much as I love them. Uh, it's very difficult to find a place for a 12-foot pew. And so we've done the math. Uh, they're, they're about $68 a chair for stackable chairs. They have to be stackable because if they're not stackable, well, you've got another problem. Where do I put the chairs? So if they're stackable, they don't take as much room. You can maneuver it around. Um, at, at that, we're looking to get 200 chairs, and that would cover all of our, our sanctuary and our Sunday school classes. It, it's right at around 13000 right over $13,000. Yes, sir. Thanks, because I was about to calculate that. Praise so the Lord. Yes, sir. It's between thirteen and 14000 you No, know, but but if a chair, church helped with a chair or two or three or Praise five. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. It yeah. reduces that. Every amount. chair is closer. <laughs> Every, that's for sure. Amen. For the Webster. Uh, we just finished our renovations and, and things at the storefront that we're in, and so we praise the Lord for that. But we do have... Uh, do you need 12-foot pews? No. I could work out a deal. No, we have chairs. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I can't imagine moving, moving pews. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, but we do, we do uh, still have a need for a projector, projector screen, okay. and then even some bullets and boards, things like that. Um, if, I had, if I had to guess, I'd, I'd say about $1,000 would, would cover all of that. But. All right. All right. Brother Rolando? Um, one week before coming, they uh, stole my wife's computer, and I'm yes. trying to recover that. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, she doesn't write my sermons, but <laughs> she rewrites them a lot because we try to reduce them down to a trifolds, yeah. and uh, that's been a way we, we get out short, uh, short uh, excerpts of the sermons that would sure. be useful to anybody who could use them. What would that computer cost that would replace Hannah's stolen one? About $300 probably would be a fine. All right. Well, church, these are the needs that have been presented, and I think we've heard them and we understand them. I hope that for you, these testimonies have been a help to your faith. To hear someone's honest experiences is a blessing and an encouragement. Brother John. Amen. <coughs> We have another missionary here. His name is Dr. John O'Malley. Amen. Brother John, is there maybe a certain need that 
Do you and Sister Kim have, or maybe something for the mission? I'm doing a lot of video work right now. Okay. And for our online missions conference and other projects. And I've not shopped a lot, but I'm needing a high quality camera that is more than just my iMac little tiny camera, but a proper camera for that. And I'm imagining that's probably in the six to eight hundred range. Six to eight hundred dollars. What I did, folks, I just took the pictures of the missionaries and wrote down each the item and how much they were asking for, okay? And the more as you feel led, hopefully you will, to pray about it tonight and to give towards this, and then we'll give you a grand total tomorrow night. I know a lot of our missionaries are going to be heading out after tonight. Uh, we will definitely alert you and let you know how things did, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'm going to ask our missionaries to head on back to the seats. We have... Sergio, and yes. Heather, and then there goes Jamie Jackson. What we're going to do, Sergio and Heather, if you guys can sing for us, and we close out tonight, and then we're going to sing a song, and then there goes Jamie Jackson. One day, a woman named Louise fell asleep in her bed and dreamed a very fitful dream. She dreamt that someone in hell wrote a letter to her, and it was to be delivered to her by a messenger. The messenger passed between the lakes of burning fire and brimstone that occupies hell and found his way to the door that would lead him to the outside world. Louise dreamed that the messenger walked to her house came inside and gently but firmly woke Louise up. He gave her the message saying only that a friend had wrote it to her from hell. Louise, in her dream, with trembling hands, took the letter and read. so much pain here and through it all I see your face I'm glad you're bound for heaven and you won't reach this bitter end but 
but it's so hard to stay here, knowing that you were once my friend. You taught me many things that's true. I called you friend, I trusted you. We walked by day and talked by day night. But now I know that it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate and shown me how to walk in paths of life. But you let me live and love and die. You knew I'd never live on high. And now I stand each day at last condemned. And yes, I called you friend in life. I trust you through joy and strife. But now I see that you are not my friend. And now I'm lost forever. I'm burning in this awful place. I'm suffering so much pain here, and through it all I see your face. I'm glad you're bound for heaven, and you won't reach this bitter end. But it's so hard to stay here, knowing that you were once my friend. After reading the letter, Louise awoke. The dream was still so real in her mind, and sweat dropped from her body in pools. She swore she could still smell the acrid smell of brimstone and smoke from her room. As she contemplated the meaning of her dream, she realized that as a Christian, she has failed in her duty to go out to all the world and preach the gospel. As she thought of that, she promised herself that the next day, she would call Marsha and invite her to church with her. The next morning she called Marsha and this was the conversation. Yes? Bill, is Marsha there? Louise, you don't know? No, Bill, no what? Marsha was killed last night in a car accident. I thought you had known. Fellow Christian, is this your testimony? Are you witnessing to your friends that you are with every day? Or will there be a friend in yours in hell asking you why you did not tell them about Jesus? So tell your friends about the Lord So they won't reach this awful place So they won't suffer so much pain And in their suffering see your face I'm glad you're bound for heaven And you won't reach this bitter end Please bring your friends to Jesus So they can all you call you friend Please bring your friends to Jesus And they will always call you friend doing this week to try to reach people with the gospel here and around the world. Tomorrow we do the Faith Promise Cards. Hope you're praying and asking God what He will give through you uh, for world evangelization in this new mission year starting uh, next Sunday, in the first Sunday in May. All right. I think Brother Evangelist Jackson, where'd he go? Come on over here, preacher. This is my first chance getting to meet him. He's preaching for the Anchor Baptist Church tomorrow. Amen. Amen, brother. Brother Jamie, I'll call you that. I'm Brother John. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Would you tell us a little bit about your ministry and close us in prayer? Sure. Yes, Sunday school tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Missionaries in all the classes. Some exciting times coming tomorrow, okay? Amen, preacher. Thank you. Boy, what a great opportunity it is to be here tonight. If I could sum up my ministry, it would be like this. I still believe that God's still on the throne. Amen. I still believe in the old King James Bible. 
I still believe in claiming those promises that God has provided. I'm here just to help churches. Boy, the same way that someone helped me, the same way that a preacher, boy, that was <clears throat> in junior church, boy, how he preached that there was a hell and that it was real and that, and that if I understood the words that were coming out of his mouth and I didn't accept that wonderful gift that God had for us, I, would, I could spend my eternity in that place called hell. Boy, I didn't like that. That didn't go over very well at all with me. Boy, I was like you, madam. Boy, that scared me to death. And I just wanted to tell everybody that there's hope. Boy, there's hope in America. Boy, can I tell you this? We got some dark days. But as I come across in history some of those dark days, boy, it seemed like right after those dark days, God, God showed up, our God showed out, and boy, great awakenings begin to happen. I'm here to tell you that I, that same God that served them then is the same God that serves us now. Boy, when I begin to look around the auditorium, boy, I said, here am I, Lord, send me. Boy, I remember when there was a preacher, by the way, the preacher isn't too far away from here. Boy, the preacher said, who's going to go and tell my my loved ones. He's like, my grandson is going to come. He said, my greatest fear is for no one to tell my grandson about the greatest news that he could ever hear. Boy, I remember my heart began to burn within. Boy, someone had to stand in the gap. Someone had to be there for his generation. Boy, I remember he said, who's going to come? Who's going to come? Who's going to come? Boy, he didn't give an altar call. Boy, asking for preachers and stuff. He said, I just want you to do what God wants you to do. Boy, I remember my heart burned within. Boy, I was that preacher. Boy, I was that person, boy, I walked up and I said, I don't know what God wants me to do. But boy, when you mentioned, boy, someone's got to stand in the gap, I said, I'll go. And I was like, I don't know what God wants me to do, but whatever it is, boy, I'm willing to do it. Can I tell you this? Boy, I was at a camp in Montana of all places. I surrendered in Chicago. I was in a camp in Montana. Boy, I'm preaching there, and the sermon didn't have anything to do with surrender. And all of a sudden, boy, several young men and boy, young ladies came down. And boy, afterwards, they were like, tell us the commitments. How, what did you do? Boy, when God spoke to your heart, boy, and they began to say, boy, what God had done for them. And then one young man popped up, and he said, my name is so-and-so. And immediately, my head went up. Because his last name caught my attention. Then all of a sudden, afterwards, I find myself making my way to this young man. And I said, young man, I hope you don't mind me asking you this. I said, is your dad, well, it wouldn't be his dad. I was like, is your grandfather, and I named the pastor's name as I got real big. And he said, yes, sir. He's like, he's a preacher. I said, is your grandfather this, this person? He said, yeah. He said, I surrendered unto your grandfather. I said, you said, he said, who's going to be there for my grandson? Can I tell you this? I hate this worldly philosophy that's trying to separate us. Amen. Amen. Trying to separate us by color. Come trying on. to separate us by faith. Right. Trying to separate us by anything that they could possibly right. say. Can I tell you this? I'm glad to call you my brother. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I can call you my sister. I'm glad that I'm a part of God's family. Amen. I'm glad that I can stand in the gap the same way that someone stood in the gap for me. Amen. I am simply a servant. Amen. Right now I am working with several missionaries. Boy, working with Spanish, <clears throat> uh, reaching, reaching Spanish nations. Boy, we we're talking about not only preaching, but having camps and revivals and stuff. Not only in America, but in other places. Boy, yes, I would be like those missionaries here where I would ask for your prayers and stuff there. But as I preach, even in America, preach revivals and preach camps and beg God to move again the same way that he did yesterday. By the way, he said he's no respecter of persons. Boy, you talked about George Mueller and all those guys and boy, how they could pray it down. You know that same God we still can pray to today. Amen. Right. Amen. Well, oftentimes I hear this, man, God is coming back. Man, God's coming back. I, I don't know. God's coming back. I said, if God's coming back, then where's that sense of urgency that we have? I was like, if God's coming back, we should be telling everybody that we talk to. Boy, someone mentioned about, boy, telling their people not to be just so winners. I mean, not to be so winning, but actually be a soul winner. Well, I don't know about you, but every place I go, boy, I want to tell somebody, hey, if this is the last days, then, boy, I want to make sure that with me when we go to heaven. I wonder which grandmother we come to 
boy, they're praying for someone to speak to their young one. And all of a sudden, boy, that young one comes by us, but we're too busy with life. Instead of just being a soul winner, being God conscious. Oftentimes, I get an opportunity to go to churches and preach. One of the things when I was there, talking about my ministry, when I preached, is the pastor said this. He said, Jamie, I see you at the camps, and I see you at different places, and I like the way you do the videos and stuff. He said, Jamie, he said, I brought somebody else in, and I brought this company in, and they wanted to charge me $20,000 for church uh, promotional videos. And I was like, brother, I said, I have a lot of that technology, a lot of that stuff there. I was like, I can be at help. He's like, how much would you charge me? I was like, brother, God didn't tell me to go and make this a business. And then God told me to be a help. I said, brother, I'm already here. I got the equipment in my car because I just love photography and videography. I was like, let's go ahead and set it up. And all of a sudden, boy, one preacher saw that and said, man, I like what you did there. And all of a sudden, another preacher said, man, I like what you did there. And I'm like, whoa, Lord God can use this too. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Boy, <clears throat> before I even surrendered, boy, one thing that God gave me the ability to do is Boy, to allow his saints to laugh a little. Amen. Boy, we had family fun nights, literally, where I, I would tell the pastors, and I love telling them this, to see the fear come on their face. Well, I said, hey, brother, I'm going to split your church in two. <laughs> I'm like, not like that. I was like, literally, I'm going to split everybody into two, have two different teams. And I'm like, all the games will be uh, designed around letting your church have a merry heart. I was like, there's nothing like saints getting together and, and courts having food, but there's nothing like laughing together. I was like, we can serve God, we can have fun together too, and do it the right way. Boy, this has been a great thing that God has allowed also in my ministry. But it's not just about me. It's about the results that it has. I'm just here simply to say, go ye into all the world, like, Lord God, I... I want to serve you, Lord God. I just want you to use me the same way you use some of those men. Not that it can be said that I did something, but that my ministry can be pointed towards you. Amen. 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 Oh, can I tell you this? I still believe that God can move in America. Amen. You say it's very dark. Well, the church should be the lighthouse. Amen. Sounds like we have the best light that we could possibly have. Let us... Let it shine, Amen. whether it's here or whether it's in another nation. America has always been the lighthouse, even in the world. I believe we have a lot of people here represent pretty big light. We represent a pretty big God. Let's let it shine everywhere. Heavenly Father, we sure do thank you, Lord God, for your saints. Lord God, we thank you for your people Lord God, that can claim your promises from your Bible. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you just bless this time. We ask that you bless the needs in this room. And Lord God, even the desires or the visions that you've given, Lord God, for <clears throat> the men of God that are in here, and even their wives. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you just please just bless like you did yesteryear. Oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you move like you moved yesteryear. Please do something Lord God, with all of us, we give you the honor and praise. Lord God, please bring those people back tomorrow, and please help there be another great day like there already has been in this conference. We give you the honor and praise. In your blessed son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.